Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 18th of the fourth month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, which happens to line up with the 1st of July, 2023 on the Gregorian calendar. And now that we've finished last week with the book of Hanok, and we're getting back on our chronological reading of the scriptures and the other writings that are related to it, we had backtracked a little bit because we're in the book of Genesis, but we're at the Exodus era. I wanted to go back a little bit and start with the book of Hanok, because that actually was written before that time. And now that we're done with that, we want to kind of catch up with the other writings that would have been contemporary or between the writing of the book of Hanok or what we call First Enoch, and then the writings of or the times of Genesis. <clears throat> Some of those are firsthand accounts of the patriarchs of Lemek, of Noah, and of Abram, for example. But we are not going to get to that point quite yet. So what we have here is called it's, it's the tales of the patriarchs in the newest version of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. In its original rendition, it was called the Genesis Apocryphon, and it is also known as um, 1QAP Gen for the scroll text numbers for their, identi their identifiers there. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, this is literally the firsthand writings of some of the, the patriarchs, like I had mentioned, and you get a little bit of congruent information from what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So without further ado, I'd like to just show some of this and go through these before we get back on with what we are reading. The, the start of the text, and sometimes they'll compile things together that aren't all written by the same individual, and these are all translations of things that they put together these are copies of copies and they piece together the scrolls based on the handwriting that they think is from the same author so whether or not all of this was originally together or if it was just penned by the same gentleman is to is debatable but we'll go through here just so you can see this first part where i'm not going to read it all but you can see it has to do with the giants. They're being judged for the adulterous acts that they had done and why they did it, okay? A contemporary writing, again, is called the Book of the Giants. There was some fragments of it found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that book was known in antiquity to predate the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But it was always only in fragments in foreign languages. I think Sanskrit had one and a few others did as well, but it was not known in the Hebrew that I'm aware of until the Dead Sea Scrolls were released. But those were the firsthand accounts of the giants and titans, the things that they were doing at that time and the visions and dreams that they were having and the interpretations that they had sought from Hanok at that time. It, doesn't go into too much detail but it does it does corroborate and collab or it does corroborate with the information that we have in the scriptures that the extra or hidden writings like yobelim hanok and the common scriptures that we call the bible all right here's more from the same right this would be from the watchers or that era leading up to the flood And then as you as you leave, you're, you, you can pause this and read these to your heart's content. You can also find these available online. If you're not able to find this particular scroll, I can share it if you want. Just let me know. All right. Talking about things that are also reminiscent as it would be in the times of Noah. So it will be with the coming of the son of Adam. Right, you read about the things going on in Revelation, the things that people were doing, and it's not quite not different.
they say that this is Aramaic as opposed to Hebrew. And really, if you look at the difference between the languages, they're very similar. Din would be judge instead of Dan or Don. Dom is also used. Don is a still a chief in Spain today. That's carried over pretty well. But the tribe of Dan, it means to judge, right? The biggest difference between the Aramaic and the Hebrew, just so you know, is they'll tend to have an aleph at the end of certain words. That one's he. But um, like right here, they tend to have alephs at the end, basar, for the good news or your word or meat. Yeah, they have this is unto all flesh. Basar is flesh or the, the what we have for good news is basara with a hay at the end. But basar is flesh, and you see they add an aleph there for the Aramaic. And this is where he sent them down, and there was a curse on them, right? You remember the events that happened? We just read about the flood, what the Nephilim did, where the watchers did, right? What they did to conceive him. I'll go ahead and read this part because this is getting into where I wanted to go. When it has a vacat, that means there's a blank spot. There's a space in the text, and then it goes on. They do that to break up things, right? So you have the accounts leading of the watchers, and it, there would have been more here, a lot more text that's missing. This would have been possibly the accounts and things that Hanok was writing. But then you have right here, there's space, and it says, Then I, Lemek, was upset. So I approached Bet Enosh my wife and said to her this is where you get the the name of lemic's wife right the house or bat sorry is the daughter of enosh bat enosh right and she was literally of the daughters of enosh as opposed to the daughters of cain but then it breaks off and it says i bear witness by the most high by the mighty Yahuwah, by the king of all ages, one of the sons of Shemaim, until you recount truthfully everything for me, whether you must recount truthfully for me without lies, the son from you is unique by the king of all ages until you will speak truthfully with me without lies. So if you remember, we read, I believe it was in the chapters 105, but the birth of Noah was when Lemek came to his wife, was asked, he came to his father and then had his father go to Hanok to inquire whether or not this son that was born was really his because his eyes lit up the house like the sun, his face glowed and he was speaking praises to our creator as a, as a child, if you remember. And all of those are physical, literal things that were foretelling future events as well. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have perfected praise, right? But um, this is the same account right here. However, it goes into a little more detail. I do believe I mentioned that, and we can see it for ourselves. It says, Then Bat Enosh, my wife, spoke with me very harshly, or very you know, harshly and wept. And she said, Oh, my brother and my husband, recall for yourself my pleasure. All right. And it's got the text for everything right here. This gives you kind of an accurate idea of what's missing and how much space is in between each line of text. So you can see there's sometimes there's a great deal. And that's whenever you see this dot, 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 or bracket, where you have these missing words, okay? Sometimes it could be multiple words. Sometimes it could just be part of a word. But Bat Enosh is still speaking here, and she's giving witness to uh, the fact that she's only been trustworthy to him. It says, in the heat of the moment, in my panting breath, I am telling you everything truthfully, right? So it breaks off. It, she's getting very emotional. She's trying to appeal to him. And you can rightly imagine what it would be like if you're, you know, 
your child was born in such a manner and your your husband was accusing you of doing something illicit. I I can't imagine the circumstances that they were living through. When you have literal giants that were so massive and and supernatural things happening like they're they're normal. If you look at the book of the giants, if you pay attention to what the homilies and recognitions and all these different things say, these watchers can change their shapes. They're like what we call the the pagan mighty ones of old are are patterned off of them. The idea of changing your shape, appearing however you please, doing miraculous things. And then their children that were born of them were massively huge. Some of them could fly. Some of them can do pretty supernatural things of their own right. But they weren't as powerful, if you will, as their progenitors or the watchers themselves. <clears throat> but it says, Now when Bat Enosh, my wife, saw that my demeanor had changed because of my anger, then she controlled her emotions and continued speaking with me. She was saying to me, Oh, my husband and my brother, Lispus, my pleasure. I swear to you by the great set apart one, by the king of Shemaim, that this seed is from you, and from you this conception, and from you the planting of this fruit breaks off, and not from any stranger nor from any of the watchers, nor from any of the sons of Shemaim. Why is the appearance of your face changed and contorted like this, and your ruach breaks off upon you like this, breaks off? So she, she equates a change of face and his emotions to be a change of ruach, something to keep in mind. Right. I'm speaking truthfully with you. Vacate it breaks off. And then this is what we're more reminiscent of, right? From the book of Hanok. It says, Then I, Lemek, ran to Methuselah, my father, and told him everything. Breaks off to Hanok, his father, in order to learn everything from him with certainty, since he is a beloved and with the Kadosh ones and his lot apportioned, for they make everything known to him. When Methuselah, my father, heard, he ran to Hanok, his father, to learn everything truthfully from him. All right, the Hebrew for anyone who wants to look at it. This is his will, and he went through the length of the land of Parvain, and there he found the end of the earth. So now we see there's quite a bit that's missing. This particular text doesn't have any more of that account, which we do have in the book of Hanok. But now you're skipping quite a bit of detail, quite a bit of time, and you're getting to after the flood, when his children were apportioning the land Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is still the same account. This is when he came to him. I, uh, please forgive me. I thought it had skipped. Eventually it will, and they'll go to when the three sons of Noah are par parceling out the land for themselves. But this is still Methuselah speaking to Hanok. So it says, And he went through the length of the land of Paravain, and there he found the end of the earth, or land. And he said to Hanok, his father, My father and my master, I have come to you, Lispus, to me, and I say to you, do not be angry that I came here to seek you out, breaks off, fearful of you, breaks off. And then it talks about, for in the days of Yarad, my father, he, he the watchers had come down, and that would have been Hanok speaking, right? This is literally the parts that were in the first Enoch, as it's called, or the book of Hanok that we just read. So you can see that they had the first-hand writings of it here, where they had the actual accounts. And these were copied down separately from those books, but it also carried. And we can have two witnesses to establish that these facts are true, right? 
it talks about the the sons of the Shemaim were dwelling and the the watchers that came down and that Noah was truly his son and he's foretelling what was going to happen and he is the one who will divide the entire earth right foretelling the what would happen with the division of the land amongst his children sorry this is the the biggest thing that you're going to learn when you're studying the dead sea scrolls in particular is that you're really looking at tatters fragments of the original writings every one of them is in bits and pieces because it was it was preserved and decaying it was falling apart so the things that they have are only what were they were able to retain and, and piece together in some cases the insight that we can find in them is amazing however so i i highly encourage to look at them for yourself get an english translation that you can comprehend multiple if you can look at them in a group go through what is in scripture that relates to them find out how they match up it's how we learn ask yahuwah ask the father to allow his mashiach to be your teacher and he will do so. But right here it says, and he gave to Methuselah his son, and he gave to Methuselah his son comprehension, right? And Yahu will give to him for an everlasting name, right? And this is speaking of Hanok. <clears throat> this is very broken. It might be continuing with the theme of what he was talking about. Same thing here. And again, you can look at this in more positive at your heart's content. So now he's finishing that and he wrote them all in the scroll of remembrance. And now he's given it to his son, Methuselah. So this is more reminiscent of what was after that time in the book of Hanok as well, right? But it still seems to be about uh, the Lemek coming to him, which is interesting all right and it says and now i am talking to you my son and making known to you all that breaks off then truthfully breaks off go say to lemek your son the child is truly from you and not from the sons of shamayim and his heights on the earth and every act of judgment i will entrust to him breaks off he lifted his face to me, and his eyes shone like the sun. This child is a light, and he breaks off the seed from a stranger. Yeah, it, it breaks off. It becomes incoherent, but it, it doesn't have a good right here. It's talking about the bad things that are going to happen. If you remember, Hanok was told that his children would go apostate too. And he even saw it in his life. If you have read the book of Yobelim, which we have covered before, and we will be covering again as soon as we get to Moshe on the Mount Sinai, that's when it was given. So we'll cover that probably here in a few weeks, actually. But um, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, yeah, so... That was when the book of Yobelin was written. But in there, he's also talking about these things. When Hanok or when uh, Noach was born, what was happening in regard to him, the, the things that he'd done. One interesting fact that you find out was that he used the stars to calculate the times to know exactly when things were supposed to be, in particular, when to get married or when to have children, when his children should be married. And um, I find that to be very interesting because it goes right in line with what is in the book of Revelation and literally throughout scripture, but we haven't been taught to think about it that way. I'm sure many people are familiar. And there's even the first time I ever heard about it, the good news in the stars, if you will, that there's a few books talking about that, the witness in the stars, the Maseroth, 
right? The Maserat by Francis Roslin is a great one from the 1800s. The um, E.W. Bollinger is The Witness in the Stars. There's a few other ones that are pretty decent about that. But the first idea I had about the good news accounts and the literal stories within scripture being in the stars was actually from a uh, agnostic or from an atheistic website. And I thought, I didn't know that at first. I clicked on it, went to it, and it was talking about how the good news accounts, what our Mashiach did, all the miracles, the different stories, it was all right there in the stars. But it was the author's premise that they had been ripped off by these these heathen copying Christians that just stole the, what was already there and made it their own. And it shocked me when I found out what his premise was. But the stuff that he was showing was amazing. All the stories, the everything with the way the luminaries function, um, with the accounts of what he did in parable form, everything lined up with the constellations, with the movement of the stars and the different stories. And when you look at the original covenant writings, the same is true there. The idea of the enemy having his head cut off and presented is, is literally what they call Perseus and Medusa in, in the Greek constellations of them, or what they call the Al Ghul is the, the head of the the head of the enemy that's being lifted up by the breaker there, which is the Peretz or Perseus in the Greek, right? <clears throat> but that was the story of Dawid and Goliath. You have those literally all over the place. And those are types and pictures that were literally fulfilled, but it was to teach us just like Revelation goes through and showing you what was, what is, and what was to come at the time it was written. Uh, the stars were a means to do that. And everything that happens in the constellations with the luminaries, with the, what they call planets or wandering stars, where they're at, where the sun and moon are, and what is going on with whether or not it's what we call meteor showers or solar or lunar eclipses. These are all things that are described in his word and have meaning and effect on creation. It's perverted by the adversary to be like astrology, thinking that, oh, you're your fate is determined by the course of the stars and you can know all these things about it. But in reality, it's telling his story. It's literally letting us know what is in, re in reality based on what he said, if we only know how to perceive it. And for, and again, anyone that wants to learn about how you can do that, the Antichrist for Dummies video series goes into great detail. It shows you emphatically the events that happened, the words that are written, the signs in the sky, and how they all correlate together. So I highly recommend everyone to test the, that to them for themselves and they can see. And then if you look at the things in the Dead Sea Scrolls, all this stuff starts clicking more. They literally have a scroll that they call the, the divination text, I believe it is. And it goes through all the mansions of the moon throughout a year, presumably, but it goes through a, a section, a, a, just a fragmented section of it. And then it has when certain things happen in certain parts of the sky or constellations or different direction, whether or not it's a thundering boom or a trumpet sound or a storm going on or something, it, it would foretell events with significance of certain meaning. And that very thing is what you see in Revelation. You have the luminaries and what they're doing and then the corresponding events that happen on earth, but it's in a much larger scale. So none of this stuff is just randomly out of the blue. It can all be built upon what is literally from the beginning as you go, but it's not clearly taught is the problem. It's intentionally hidden. And if you, <clears throat> if you realize, you know, if you, if you realize that it is and you see it, it's easy to know why. But back on point here, this is now he's coming back to him and he's making known to Methuselah that he heard the words and he gave it to Lemek, his son, in a mystery, right? And then he's rejoicing. And now you get to a copy of the book 
of the words of Noah, and that's after a space. <clears throat> so at first you had someone, uh, possibly Hanok's writings, then you had Lemech and Methuselah going to Hanok, and now you have Noah himself in his own hand writing these words. This isn't known outside of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I do believe that this text right here is what we would call uh, the Book of Yashar, or the Book of the Upright, which is the first-hand account of the patriarchs. We don't have much more than what you can see. It's got Noah and then Abram. There may be a little bit afterwards, but um, this is what I think that was. We don't have any other evidence for it other than it's not... We know that there was such a book, and we don't have an actual legitimate copy of it anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. But now this is Noah in his, in his first-hand writing, okay? And he says, He was from infancy, and through the uterus of she who bore me, I burst forth for uprightness, or yesharim, Right? And when I emerged from my mother's womb, I was planted for righteousness. All of my days, I conducted myself uprightly, continually walking in the paths of everlasting truth. For the set-apart one had instructed me to, and it breaks off, in the ways of the paths of truth, and to keep myself away from the highway of deceit which lead to everlasting darkness, and to consider whether I would, Yahuwah. So I girded my loins in the vision of truth and wisdom, or chokmah, in the robe of supplication, and it breaks off quite significantly. You can see between four and what was left of five, they just have a little bit of text. This is all the paths of violence. That word for violence right there. I don't know if any of you read Hebrew, but that's heith, maim, samik. So it would be chamas. Or you guys know it as a terrorist group today called Hamas, right? That word Hamas means violence in Hebrew. And it's not a Hebrew terrorist group, but it has a Hebrew name. Go figure. It says, Then I, Noah, became a grown man. I held fast to righteousness and strengthened myself in Chokmah, Lispus. I went and took M. Zera. M. Zera. So it's the people's seed, or the seed of the people, or the mother of the seed, like the seed of the, the mother. It depends on whether that's I'm or for Emma, for mom, or am for people. It really just depends. But it says, I went and took M. Zara, his daughter is my wife. She conceived by way of me and gave birth to three sons and daughters. Then I took wives for my sons from among the daughters of my brothers, and my daughters I gave to the sons of my brothers, according to the custom of the eternal statute that, the, that Yahuwah of eternity gave to mankind. So, before the Torah of Moshe, you have Torah that's already given. And this isn't the first. There's also instructions on how to give offerings, instructions on how to cultivate the land, quite a few things uh, not to eat meat with blood. Not only was it something that predated all the way from the garden, you had his Torah with men, his instructions with man that we were to follow. But after the garden, not only was it in established from the beginning, but it was changed. It was added to by the Almighty, and some was taken from. And it's not the first time it happened, and it will not be the last time it happened. 
although people will say that he he doesn't change, which is true. He doesn't change, but he can change the instructions that he gives to his creation because he's not encumbered by things like we are. <laughs> he can do what he wants with his own. A lot of people have a lot of ideas, but it, it doesn't bear with the facts. Here's a simple one. Man was in the garden, was told to eat only vegetables. Eventually, man was given to eat all types of meat. Then specifically, his children, those in covenant with him, are given instructions on certain types of meat to use as food and certain types to abstain from, whether just not to use it at all, to completely separate yourself from that animal, or to do so after its death. Later on, after a Mashiach came and died, the added bonds, the idea that you have to abominate the things or that you are unclean and have to go through purgations and sacrifices and washings to become clean again, were all done away with because in him, it is yes and amen, it's fulfilled. So we trust in his offering of himself for all of those things that we had to do with the added bonds. But you still keep his Torah. You still have dietary instructions for those that are within covenant because there's characteristics of these creatures that you're not to have. And that's reminiscent in not partaking of them as a, a food. You do the one and the other together because he's never changed it. And this is stuff that you can see in the apostolic constitutions and even in the common scriptures. Um, that's an excellent question. It's a, a husband should not sleep with wife if she is unclean, right? When you're talking about when an old woman is in her monthly, then yes, uh, you're supposed to abstain for the week. It doesn't matter if she does not go for a week. The seven days is what is enjoined for us to do. Um, if you touch a dead body or a dead animal, or you do something that made you ritualistically unclean in that capacity, those are not pro prohibitions. There is no washing and waiting a week before you can rejoin the assembly. None of There is um, no wrong in touching the dead. It was done by the patriarchs. It, it was prohibited in the times of the Mosaic Covenant as an added bond of transgression to teach men righteousness, right? But it's not something that we have to adhere to today. Now it's explicitly enjoined and it's gone over in detail in the heresies section of the apostolic constitutions, including when a woman's in her separation. If she stops praying, if she believes that she's unclean and separated from the Ruach and dies in that thought process, then she dies separated from him. Because as you believe, it is reckoned to you, even if you choose to believe poorly. But if you believe that his Ruach is inseparable to you, and you are one with him, then that's what you get. But um, we are to abstain from being intimate with our wives in that time. Just like you are to, uh, you're not to come to your prayer while you're in sin. If you realize that you, you did something, or you've offended someone and it comes to your mind as you're getting ready to pray and thank your maker, you are to leave your offering, go make right, and then offer, and then make your prayers, okay? When we do an offering, when we say a prayer, or back in the original covenant times when they gave a physical offering, it mentions that you offer up your entire soul when you do so. And if your soul is an abominable stench to him, because of your disposition and how you're treating other people, and you have, uh, you have un, un, you have things that are left undone. There are people that you've offended that you haven't made restitution to. That makes the whole offering an, a, an offensive thing, and you're it's like a child doing the very thing you're told not to, and then being obnoxiously. Uh, 
of being obnoxious right in the presence of your your mother or father just to get caught in doing the very act that you were told not to do. I mean, it doesn't ever go over well. <clears throat> Sorry. I was trying to find a way to put that that would make it simple to get a lot of a lot of times we we overthink things and overlook it, but it 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 is in relation as a father to his children or uh, as a parent to their children, right? We can see it that way. But back on track here. It says, during my days, when there were completed for me according to the calculation by which I reckoned, breaks off, ten yobelim, then the time of my sons taking women for themselves in marriage came to a close. And Yahuwah of Shemaim appeared to me in a vision. I looked and was shown and informed about the conduct of the sons of Shemaim. And how all breaks off Shemaim. I hid this mystery within my heart and did not make known or make it known to anyone. It says to me, it breaks off right at the beginning. It says, and the great watcher to me through an errand and by an emissary of the great set apart one to me breaks off he revealed and he spoke with me in a vision he stood before me and said loudly to you o noach and through an emissary of the great set apart one to me a voice proclaimed to you they are speaking o noah it breaks off it says before me so i considered all the behavior of the sons of the earth I comprehended and saw all of, breaks off, and you see there's a, a significant portion missing here, right? They would succeed, and they chose among them, and this is two weeks, and was sealed up. So, he was shown what would happen, he was given things, and if, if you know, eventually he's going to be enjoined to build the ark because of what he's witnessing right here. The things that they did, both with the watchers and then their offspring, the Nephilim, right? Which, if you recall, there was three sets. You had the watchers, who had what we would call the titans or the very largest ones that were like mountains high. And then they had the, the little intermediary, but it's just still extremely massive compared to men. And then they had the giants that were the ones that would eat amongst themselves and mankind. But the larger ones were so big, they didn't even bother with men. They would just eat the other giants. This is in bearing witness to the blood that the Nephilim had poured out. I was silent and I waited until breaks off. The Kadosh ones who with the daughters of men breaks off, making it unclean by the div divinatory arts. If you remember the secrets of the Shemaim, the reprobate ones of a lesser value, or what the watchers taught the sons of men, which were divination, magic, astrology, the cutting of roots for uh, sorcery, the um, prognostication by different means using, like they do it with livers, they do it with birds, they do it with weather. All of these things were taught by them, it, as mentioned in the book Hanok. And it's the arts that they use that they contrive to cause men to go astray in sinning against their maker, which causes us to sin. And the sin is what causes all the problems that we have in our life and in the world at large. But I, Noach, found favor or grace, prominence, and justification right? It's being declared right in the eyes of Yahuwah. Right. And he's talked about how the eternal plant of righteousness, right, would come from him. And he was told to keep the animals and birds. We're familiar with that. And he was given dominion just like Adam was to him and his posterity. Notice that it would roll over every Shemayim body as well. 
all of this ties in if you're keeping in what the sun represents with scripture i'm sure we've covered this before the moon might not be as readily apparent but if you remember we did a study on the book of gad the seer and in that on chapter one we went into detail on what the moon is representative of throughout the scriptures and the apocryphal writings the testaments of the 12 patriarchs the dead sea scrolls gad the seer everything that mentions the moon it, the sun represents the bridegroom which is our mashiach the light of the world okay it, the sun also means the shemesh is a servant or the steadfast servant that runs the corset before him without turning from it which is our mashiach right who is the light of the world that came to enlighten the hearts of men. The moon is the Shemaim Yarushalayim, or the Malkuth Shemaim, the kingdom of the Shemaim, if you will, representative of the earthly kingdom in Yarushalayim at first, but in the line of Dawid specifically, right? And you can see that even in the genealogies from Dawid, 14 generations from Abraham, or the crescent moon to the full moon of Dawid, 14 from Dawid to the Babylonian captivity or the darkness of the moon, and then 14 from the return to the coming of our Mashiach. So um, that pattern has continued throughout history to re be reminiscent of the earthly kingdoms of his people and the kingdom of the Shemaim that the sun came to establish. And then the stars are the children of light, right? The assemblies that know him who named them and show forth him who numbers them. Which, as we were just speaking of, the stars in the sky literally declare him. The meanings of the names of the stars point out the good news account, if you recall, which has been known for a few hundred years at, at the very least in great detail. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is where he's being foretold to that he his posterity would survive the coming disaster and they would inherit the earth. It's already getting on in time, so I don't want to take too much of our time just looking at stuff like this where it's broken, but I do want you to be able to see it and stop at your leisure to look at it and for anyone who's watching the video. This part continues in this Genesis Apocryphon for quite a bit, but you get to see that he's actually having a vision. And the vision that he has in particular right here is about a tree and what's going to happen with his children is when he was drunk, it says in scripture, when he had the wine in here, it mentions that that's when he had this vision. And in that vision, he sees what Ham is going to do by shaming him when he walks in on his nakedness. And then he sees that Canaan is going to be cursed and the other things that are going to happen to his children through history, which would have been an amazing resource to find and have a, a full text of. It would have it would have really helped tie things in together. But we can still do so with the actual events in history that have happened. So you can see now it's at the flood. He rejoices when the when the ark of the springs receded, right? And then they traveled the land. It gets a little more detail here. And this is, uh, perhaps we'll pick it up next week or we'll, we'll see. But then it goes into where we've been familiar in the book of Yobelim and in the common scriptures where the, the land is divvied up and portioned out to the three sons of Noach, right? Just one moment. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and stop here for today, and we'll continue looking through these texts coming up to the contemporary times that we're at in the chronology of what we're reading in the scriptures which again, we're at the Exodus times right before that. We paused to go back and cover some of these writings that would already have been known. And as you'll see, 
the um the books that were written the writings that we have were compiled by the patriarchs and handed down to their firstborn in history through time eventually from noah to shem and then from shem until the, the coming of abram they're not mentioned again but when abram and if you pay attention to the genealogy Abram would have been the leading family of the firstborn house all the way through. His in his genealogy would have been all three sons of Ye or Noah before he was even born. Madai's daughter, which was a son of Yepheth, married into the the family first, and then Ham's uh, line married in through Nimrod by his daughter marrying Eber. <clears throat> so. Uh, there's nothing really racist about any of that, but back on point, the um, the accounts that are all there will find that they handed the books down. Eventually, no, or Abraham's given the language of creation when he repents. He's handed the books to transcribe and then to study, and then he hands them down to Yitzhak. Yitzhak gives them to Yaakov, and Yaakov will pass them to Louis. And then from Louis, you can see in the Dead Sea Scrolls that the visions of, or the Testament of Kohath, and then the, talking about the books that were handed to him, who was the, the not the firstborn of Louis, but the one whom he saw was that the Kahuna was going to be through. And then it was given from Kohath to Amram, and then from Amram to Aharon and Moshe, right? So it always been in their hands. That's why they were given what they were given, if you will. They were given the positions of authority because they were their children, their parents were given the responsibility because they asked for it. Right? And this is something you can see a pattern that repeats over and over again as well. But Ob willing, we'll finish these. We'll we'll go through the stuff that the intermediate time between the uh, account of the flood with the te te contemporary times of Noah leading up to Abraham and then on to the time of the Exodus. Most of that will be what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls here in what we call the Genesis Apocryphon and then also the Book of Yobelim and then covering the account that we have in the common scriptures. So I'm willing it will be fruitful and ev as always, if you have any comments or questions, don't hesitate. Yahoo will be with you. You have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat and week ahead. And we'll see you next time.